I was just going to ask, isn't there another part of flow regime that we can classify? I don't know if I'm making that up, but I feel like on one of the homework it was like subcritical or supercritical and one other thing. Isn't yeah. Reynolds, Reynolds Laminar and turbulent? Maybe it was that, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. You're thinking to uh, a homework assignment that was kind of where you wouldn't have yet known what flow regime was if I hadn't told you what that specifically meant. Yeah. But flow regime itself uh, doesn't require that you identify whether it's laminar and turbulent. It simply means is it supercritical versus subcritical. Okay, so you've turned in your maps for the project, did the optimization of your network, and uh, my aim is that I'll give you feedback on that by the middle of next week, which means that you can begin what's probably the easiest part of the project, which is sizing the reservoir. And uh, I'm going to go over some information today that shows how you need to size the reservoir. And part of what's going to make it so easy for you is you've already done the hardest part for one of the homework assignments, which is simply diagnosing that curve of the demand. Do you remember when you figured up hour by hour what is the percent of peak on that demand curve? I'll show it to you. You've maybe forgotten. We've covered a lot of ground since then. But the bottom line is that the next phase of the project is going to be uh, the simplest of them all. So looking at next week, you've got both a homework assignment and the exam on Wednesday. And uh, just to reiterate what I told you on Wednesday of this week, I'm going to give you the same equation packet that's been posted on Blackboard all semester. Uh, this time, though, I'm going to print out the full thing. I think that I only printed the closed conduits uh, flow for the first exam, but since we've now moved into open channel, I'm going to print the entire equation packet. So I'd recommend you familiarize yourself with that in advance of the exam, just so you know what the formulas <coughs> are and where they are. You can also prepare a page of your own notes or equations and it can be on the front and back of an 8.5 by 11 size piece of paper and you can put anything you'd like on there. You're not going to be using the computers during the exam and obviously you're not going to use your cell phone during the exam. So that means that you need to be able to do all your calculations with the calculator or your brain. So, uh, And then Friday of next week we'll have our class meeting online. We won't meet together in person. So are there any questions related to the schedule? Okay, so I emailed you an example on Wednesday that was just the two page. It was one page showing the example, one page with the solution. And it asked the question, how narrow can a channel get before uh, the flow begins to choke? And that was a contraction. Contractions are related to, but slightly different from <coughs> constriction. And maybe it's a point of trivia, but by constrictions, what we mean is um, things that are in the channel, the channel itself isn't necessarily getting narrower, but there's something in the channel that is making its effective width less than it ordinarily would be. And so this is a photo that shows an example of a constriction. You can see that there are some bridge piers encroaching on the flow area. And so, you know, whatever the width of this bridge pier is, um, it's taking up space that the water ordinarily would be flowing through. And it doesn't look like a lot of space, but it does have an effect on the depth, that constriction. So you can see that the depth seems to be slightly lower on the side of the pier than it is on the front of the pier. And partly that's related to um, what you learned about in fluid mechanics with stagnation and how streamlines can dead end at a location. And that causes a localized increase in pressure if it's closed conduit flow or a localized increase in depth if it's the upstream end of an open channel situation like this. But the constriction is causing the depth to change. And whether it's supercritical or subcritical is going to affect whether a constriction either increases the depth or decreases the depth. Because it can go either way, which is kind of counterintuitive that if you put some obstacles like this in the water, it might actually make not the water depth increase, uh, 
adjacent to the constrictions, but it could actually cause the water depth to decrease. And so we're going to talk about why that's the case. Answering the question of why, uh, excuse me, will the water level rise or fall? How do we know and why? So we don't know until we do the calculations, and we can begin by refreshing our understanding of specific energy diagrams. And remember, when we're talking about contractions, um, you're increasing the flow per unit width. So we looked at the specific energy diagrams on Wednesday. Lowercase q1 is before the constriction. Lowercase q2 is after the constriction. So the specific energy diagram shift looks the same as it did if we have a contraction. The contraction is when the channel is getting narrower. What it's doing, it's reducing B, the, the width of the channel. And so flow per unit width is increasing. And remember that this second curve here, which has a higher flow per unit width, is associated with a larger critical depth and more specific energy at the minimum point. So it's pushing it to the right and up. Contractions and constrictions both share in common an increasing flow per unit width. And so whether that pier in the river causes an increase or a decrease in the flow conditions depends on whether the uh, initial conditions were subcritical or supercritical. So when you make the flow per unit width higher, then that could have a different effect whether the, uh, the Froude number was above one and we had supercritical conditions or whether it's below one and we had subcritical conditions. So just to kind of investigate this, let's look at the following example that we'll go through quickly and then I'm going to talk a little bit about sizing your reservoir. Let's say that we've got a rectangular channel and upstream, we know that the width of the channel is 2.5 meters. We've got 0.9 meters is the flow depth. The flow rate, 2.25 cubic meters per second. And then downstream, there are a couple of piers that each have a width of 0.25 meters. And so this is like a circular pier with a diameter of 0.25. So it's reducing the effective flow width, where the original flow width upstream is 2.5 meters. If you subtract out the effective length that these piers robs the channel of, it's only got an effective flow width of 2 meters because it's 0.25 here, 0.25 there, add that together, 0.5. So we've only got a flow width of two meters. So let's go through the process of determining what is the depth of the water at this constriction. Now you'd probably guess, and you'd be right, that this is going to be specific energy. And we're going to, we're going to be looking at the, um, the impact of the reduced flow per unit width. And um, the, the interesting thing is that the, um, the specific energy isn't increasing or decreasing like it would in a step up or a step down. So the energy at 1 and the energy at 2 is the same. It's just that um, it's changing location. So we're going to say that the specific energy at 1 is equal to the specific energy at 2. And so what I can say is that the depth plus velocity head at 1 is equal to the depth plus velocity head at 2. And um, we can calculate the velocity at 1 pretty easily since we know the, uh, the area at 1 is just going to be the 2.5 meter width times the 0 0.9 meter depth. And so the velocity at 1 is the flow rate of 2.25 cubic meters per second divided by that area of 2.5 meters by 0 0.9 meters. So it leaves us with 1 meter per second. 
One meter per second is the velocity at one. So therefore, the energy at one is the depth of 0 0.9 meters plus one meter per second squared divided by 2g. So the amount of specific energy at one is 0 0.951 meters. So that's how much energy there is at one. And um, let's take a look at what is the critical depth in this situation, because we'll use that to know whether it's supercritical versus subcritical. So the flow per unit width before the constriction was, um, what is our lowercase q? Let me first write that. Our flow rate is 2.25 cubic meters per second, and the width of the channel is 2.5 meters. So I didn't actually work that out as a separate number in my calculations, but I will now. 2.25 divided by 2.5. Oh, 0.9. Did we already have that? 0.9 is the flow per unit width. 0 0.9 meters squared per second. Okay, so then y sub c is going to be 0 0.9 meters squared per second. Square that, divided by 9.81 meters per second squared. Take it to the one-third power. Our critical depth is 0 0.436 meters. So at 1, what is the flow regime? Subcritical, good, right, subcritical. Um, so that's going to tell us when we solve this cubic function, which of the two roots to select. Okay, now this is how much energy there is at 1, and at 2 it's going to be different. Um, distribution between depth and velocity head. And this is one of those cases where we don't know v at location 2, and so let's express it in terms of the unknown, uh, in terms of the flow rate that we do know. Um, so 0 0.951 equals y2 plus the, uh, the other way to write this velocity head is q squared divided by 2g a squared, where a squared is going to be 2 meters times y at location 2. Now what is this 2? What does it represent? The width. It's the width that the water actually can flow through. So we're subtracting out the pier width from the physical width of the channel. So the area of flow is going to be the depth times the width. So 2 times the depth at location 2. So it is the flow rate of 2.25 squared divided by 2 times 9.81 times um, 4y2 squared. And the 4 is because we've squared 2. OK? So that all leads us to um, 0 0.951 is equal to y2 plus 0 0.06451 divided by y2 squared. So. You're getting pretty handy at this point, I think, of taking an expression like this, multiplying each term by y2 squared, and then let me just erase some of this stuff up top and continue. Okay, so this is kind of a continuation of what is below. Um, we've got y2 cubed minus 0 0.951 y2 squared plus 0 0.06451 is equal to 0. Okay, and now we're solving for the roots of that. 
of which there will be three. I guess at this point I'll try and get this recorded into the video. So just to recap, we started by calculating the specific energy at one, and we calculated the critical depth, which when we compare the critical depth to the flow depth, we know it's subcritical. And we use the specific energy at 1, setting that equal to the specific energy at 2. Now here's our cubic equation. And then the roots, we've got the negative root, which we reject, a supercritical root, and a subcritical root. So of those, we're going to choose the, uh, the depth that the new at the pier, the flow depth is 0.865 meters. So we've got three, three roots and select y2 is equal to 0 .0, 0, uh, 0.865 meters. So this is, this is one of those unexpected cases where you can trick, uh, constrict the <laughs> flow through the channel because of the piers. And what the water does in response to that is it increases velocity around the obstacle and decreases depth. Because it doesn't have as much flow width, it has to increase the velocity to have the same flow rate going around the, uh, the obstruction. So this is kind of a, a vertical obstruction. We call it constriction. And since the uh, conditions were subcritical, the, uh, the depth decreases around the obstacle. The process is the same. All these specific energy analyses, they follow the same playbook in what we do. You know, we compare the flow regime to the depth, and we look at the energy. In this case, the specific energy, we don't have to subtract out a delta Z. You know, there's no change in the bottom of the channel bed that's going to affect the specific energy. So there's no delta Z that's taken care of like when there's a step up or a step down. So any questions about this example before we look at reservoirs? All right. So you've done demand estimation and um, you've done pipe sizing. Now you need to, in phase three, if, it's really important that you read the assignment instructions because um, there's some information there about the cost of the reservoir that is part of what you're going to do in phase three. You're going to need to interpolate <coughs> on the cost <coughs> data that's provided. But the um, the location of the reservoir is what you did in the phase two to pressurize the network. And sizing the reservoir is how you're going to ensure that there's enough water um, where water is coming from a spring. If we look at the map of the project, there's a certain symbol on that map that identifies where the water is coming from. All right, see this little symbol here? I don't know what that's called, but that's where the spring is. And so the spring is up here above elevation 300. I think many of you have your reservoir at what, like around 260? So the reservoir is over here someplace. So the water comes from the spring at a steady rate. When it's like 8 p.m. and they've got peak demand, in the town, the spring doesn't know that, and the spring has no way to react. It's coming out of the spring at a constant rate, and so the reservoir is going to be a place that water accumulates overnight when the flow demands in the city are low, and then during the day, when the flow demands exceed the supply from the spring, then the reservoir level is going to be falling. So it goes through this daily cycle. There are periods when the reservoir is filling up, and there are periods when the reservoir is being drawn down. Now, each of you has a different flow demand. 
And what you need to assume is that the flow rate from the reservoir is equal to your average daily flow. And that way it's all going to work out that during the 24 hour cycle, the flow in and the flow out are equal. This is kind of a, a mass balance. If anybody here has already taken uh, environmental engineering, you probably, or maybe you're taking it this semester. Anybody in it this semester? Okay, most of you. I'm sure you've done some mass balance already, keeping track of flow in and flow out. And it's something that we also do in fluid mechanics. But um, for the project, you're going to have to answer the question, how big should the tank be, the reservoir? How large does it need to be? Uh, the volume should be related to providing enough flow so that you can have everything above the average daily flow that's coming into the reservoir. So this blue line represents the average daily flow. And the area under the blue line to this curve, and here it's also area under the blue line to the curve, and here is the same as the area above the blue line to the curve. It represents a volume of water. The area under the curve and the area above the curve um, represents a volume because remember the horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is flow rate. So if you multiply flow rate by time, you get volume. So each of you, I think, in one of the homework problems, I asked you to figure out like what is the percent of the average day for this curve. So like midnight is 100, 1 a.m. is 98, 2 a.m. is 97. Do you remember doing that? So you've got this data, the high scale and percent of peak. And so the peak flow here at around 8 o'clock, you know that from your summary sheet on demand estimation. You know that very bottom line um, value, the, the flow rate in the very final cell at the bottom of your table? That's this. That's your design flow rate for the whole town. So that's how much is going to be coming out of the reservoir under maximum flow conditions. And so based on that, what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're, we're going to estimate the flow demands for the maximum day by tying this curve to the peak flow, which you've estimated. So you know the flow at 8 o'clock is 100%. And so you can estimate what is the flow demand in the town for the entire 24-hour cycle. So maybe somebody here has a flow demand of 400 liters per second. That's their maximum. 400 liters per second is this peak. So if 400 liters per second is your peak, then you know that at midnight, it's 36% of that. So just here on my calculator real quick, 0 0.36 times 400 is 144 liters per second. So the reservoir is going to have 144 liters per second coming out of the reservoir at midnight. But how much is coming into the reservoir at midnight? It's my average daily flow. So at midnight, since there's more coming in than going out, the reservoir is filling. So anytime this curve is below the blue line, the reservoir is filling up. And then when the curve is above it, that means that the reservoir is draining. So let's just go with this hypothetical of what if the peak demand is 400 liters per second. And I want to know how big should the reservoir be if the peak demand is 400 liters per second. So the procedure, and this is a really important point. I've noticed through this project that I'll say something in class and maybe about two-thirds of people will hear it. <laughs> and then I'll get questions from one-third of the people that makes it clear that they didn't hear it. This is a really important point. You need to reorder your table to find the hour of the day when the flow in is just beginning to be greater than the flow out. So that's not at midnight. It's before midnight. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, here I've got the data, that same data that yours may be slightly different, and that's fine. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to um, change yours Go with, uh, to, to match mine. Go with yours. 
So you've got you know, the high scale and percent of peak. You've digitized that. Um, if we take an average of that, oh, let me just do the average here. So if I average, uh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to average it yet. I'm going to find out if the maximum flow is 400 liters per second. And of course, yours is going to be different. This is just for my hypothetical value. Then the flow rate out of the reservoir is related to 400 liters per second multiplied by this percent of peak. So 400 liters per second multiplied by the percent of peak. Okay, so every hour of the day, I know what is the flow rate out of the reservoir. Let me draw a sketch on the board. <clears throat> that hopefully is going to keep it in our mind that one of the flow rates is variable, one of the flow rates is constant. Okay, so we've got this big reservoir, and um, there's a pipe coming in from the spring. Water is entering the pipe at a constant rate, and it's coming out at a variable rate. And uh, so sometimes the tank will be high, sometimes it will be dropping down, sometimes it will go back up again. So water's coming from the spring at a constant rate because that's geology. Why is there variable demand out of the reservoir? Why is it changing over time? Because of the flow table. Because of the flow table? But why does the flow table change over time? That's right. People use water less when they're asleep than they do when they're awake. And more people are asleep at night, more businesses are closed. So it's just human behavior is why it's variable. So, um, so what this is showing, this is the flow rate out. And the flow rate in is going to be the average of the flow rate out. So let me calculate the average. So equals average, just by definition, we're going to say that the flow rate in is the average of the flow rates out. So I, I've got all the flow rates out. So my flow rate in is the uh, average of the flow out over the... 24 hour cycle. So in this case, it's 254 liters per second. So we're to assume that yeah. Everybody's going to have a different flow rate into the reservoir, but you're going to have to calculate it. You're not going to assume it, but I mean, it's calculated based on the assumption that this spring just somehow magically is giving you the average of your peak day. So it's the average of this column. So now flow rate in, we've just calculated it's 254 liters per second. So I'm going to distribute that down through the entirety of this. So the volume in, volume equals flow rate times time. So 254 liters per second. How many seconds are there in an hour? 3,600. OK, so that means that there's this many liters in an hour, but I want cubic meters. So I do what? Divide How? By Divide by 1,000, because there's 1,000 liters in a cubic meter. OK, so now I know for every hour of the day how much volume came in. So every hour, there's 914, in my case, cubic meters of water coming into the reservoir. I can do the same thing to calculate the volume out. So volume out is just flow rate out times 3,600 seconds per hour. And then divide by 1,000 liters per cubic meter. OK, so when the flow rate out is relatively low, we're going to have less volume out 
than volume in. So during the 12 o'clock hour, the reservoir is going to be filling, right? Because flow out is less than flow in. The water level is getting deeper and deeper when the reservoir is filling. But midnight's not the first hour that the reservoir is filling. Um, let's look in the evening, like 8 o'clock. Maximum flow. They're using more water than is coming in. So the reservoir is draining during the 8 o'clock hour. During the 9 o'clock hour, the reservoir is draining because flow out is greater than flow in. The situation isn't quite so dire during the 10 o'clock hour because flow out is just a bit more than the flow in. But then look at 11 o'clock. At the 11 o'clock hour, the flow in is greater than the flow out of the reservoir. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to add an extra row at the top of my table. That's big. I'm going to move the 11 o'clock hour to the top of my list. So control X to, ca to cut, control V to paste. So I'm starting at the 11 p.m. hour because I want the top of my analysis to be when the reservoir is just barely starting to fill for the night. We're assuming it's empty and now it's just starting to fill. This is what we have to go through to figure out how big should the reservoir be. Because uh, if the tank isn't large enough, then we're going to run out of water during the middle of the day. So this is what we have to do is find the hour of the day when the flow in is just now finally greater than the flow out. In after the evening rush. Okay, so now this column, DSDT, it's basically um, during this hour, what's the difference between the inflow and the outflow? So it is in minus the out. So people are using water during the 11 o'clock hour, but there, there's more water coming into the reservoir than is being used. And the difference is 178.6 net accumulation of water, net storage. So I guess if I was going to give this a name, I'd say um, this is the net accumulation that occurs during the hour in question. So we assume that there is the same flow rate. I wish there was a down arrow. There might be. Insert symbol. This truly isn't worth the time, but I think there's one called arrows, right? I'm not going to. All right. Um, OK, so <coughs> this is just the hourly difference between the in and the out. So then. If you look at the midnight hour, it's even bigger because people are going to sleep. They're not using much water. So the net difference is, uh, is changing. So let me just distribute that all the way through. Now, what does it mean when it's negative? Is there an error there if it's negative? Good. Using more than you're gaining. And that's OK. That's why the reservoir is there, is to provide that buffer. It's like a shock absorber. It's ensuring that when people are, have this surge of demand, we've got a, uh, a reservoir of supply. So now this last column is maybe the only part that's tricky. So it's the accumulated storage volume. So let's assume that at 11 o'clock, it was empty. And so during the 11 o'clock hour, it accumulates 178.6, but prior to that, there was no water in the reservoir. So the accumulated amount of water at the end of the hour is only what came in during that hour because it was previously empty. OK, so then at the end of the 12 o'clock hour, the accumulated volume in the reservoir is the previous hour's water plus the new water that came in during that hour. OK, now, so then at the end of the 1 o'clock hour, it is the previous hours, like how much was there before this hour, plus how much came in during this hour. 
how much was there at the end of last hour plus how much came in this hour. Okay, I don't have to keep typing that in. Obviously, I can just drag this down through and what it will show us, if we did it right, is it gets pretty close to zero by the end. And now I think, like, why is it not showing exactly? It might be that there's just a small round off 255.86. So if I change this to 255.86, then I might get closer to zero at the end of the cycle. Mm. Oh, now my average, I threw everything off. Yeah. Uh, Hit the undo button. Oh. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, let's see. <laughs> my average isn't taking into account, yeah, it's when I reordered the rows. Remember when I took the 11 o'clock to the top? Okay, I think things will be okay now. Okay, so I want this. Okay, so my flow rate is 253.71. I should just make this equal to whatever that is and uh, anchor it. All's well that ends well, I hope. Zero. Okay, thank you. Another slow clap, two in a row. No, no, please don't. Um, now what this shows is that during a 24 hour cycle, We've had balance between in and out. But what was the original question? The original question is how big does the tank need to be? So any thoughts on that? Is there anything in here, anything in this table that suggests how big the, the tank should be? The maximum. The maximum. Good, exactly right. So we look, where is the maximum? Well, there's a formula. We can do equals max and just put the range in there so we don't even have to look. Here's our maximum. So make the tank 1.25 times the maximum amount stored. I think that's the instructions I give you in the handout is you don't want it to be like right up to the top of the tank. You want to give yourself a little bit of a safety factor. So make the tank 25% larger than the most water you expect to see inside of the 24 hour cycle. I think it's 1.25 times. I think. Double check the handout, but uh, that's. Why does it start raining? If it starts raining, we've got a valve. We can control the flow. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. That's it for today. It's 1:50. Remember that uh, we're going to have a busy week next week because you've got homework 10 due on Wednesday, and then the exam on Wednesday. All right. Good question. So the question was, do you assume the uh, water level in the tank affects the pressure downstream? No. Let's set that issue aside. Let's just stick with that your water surface elevation is the 260 that you've determined already. In the real world, you would need to keep that into, uh, into account. Alex? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's what we're going to do on Monday.